You know, you can't play in the National Football League if you're not tough. Bangs through Bosworth, touchdown Raiders! And you want to find guys that are a bust, they probably are afraid. Leave the throw, hit! In the National Football League, they make everybody be a man. Over the years, the NFL has developed into its own industry, rife with experts and can't-miss prospects. He's going to be a fine pro quarterback. Unfortunately, the science of player selection involves far more misses than hits. You know, Keith Smith made a nine on his wonder lick, right? <laughs> a nine. Some boss come out of college with great expectations, while others are the product of white-hot hype. What they all share is the disappointment of unfulfilled promise. No athlete is an athlete with the intention of being a bust. Sadly, the lowest success rate occurs in projecting the game's most important position. Man, that looks like a high school quarterback, boy. You don't talk to me, all right? Knock it off! The position of quarterback, judging it from the college level to the pro level, is almost impossible. For every great quarterback, a uh, Marino, an Elway, a Kelly, there are those guys that had the same expectations that haven't lived up to them. You can think of David Klingler or Andre Ware. As a junior at the University of Houston, quarterback Andre Ware set 26 NCAA passing records, directing the run and shoot offense. Detroit Lions select Andre Ware, quarterback. Houston. <laughs> Despite running his college offense in the pros, the Heisman Trophy winner was lost in familiar territory. There's a whole lot more to being a successful quarterback over a pretty long period of time than just having a good arm. <laughs> a whole lot more to it. While Ware wasted away in Detroit, his successor at Houston, David Klingler, was breaking all his records. Klingler put up some numbers that are just off the charts. He threw 54 touchdown passes in one season. He put up 700 yards in one game. I mean, he put up numbers that were mind-boggling. You started to think that any team that had him was going to rack up countless yards and, and touchdowns because it was effortless what he was able to do at the collegiate level. The Cincinnati Bengals select David Klingler. He went to a bad team uh, that didn't really have a lot of direction. The offensive line was falling apart. The receivers were young and inexperienced. He was taking over for a quarterback in Boomer Esiason that was enormously popular. There was just a lot of pressure put on him right away. They throw him in against Pittsburgh. That Pittsburgh defense gets sacked 10 times. What you have is the young player's confidence just collapses. And when you don't have people around you that are going to make you better or give you a chance to bring you back up, once your confidence falls, that's pretty much where it stays. As Klingler's confidence was taking a beating, so was his body. He was a tough guy because he got sacked a lot. In 33 games as a pro, he was sacked 83 times and never got comfortable with his surroundings. Here was a guy from Texas. He wore cowboy boots, and here he's coming to a kind of an urban environment in Cincinnati. I don't think that environment fit him very well. In four years with Cincinnati, Klingler threw for just under 4,000 yards, a thousand yards less than he did as a junior at Houston. The failures of our number 10 draft bust became cautionary tales for the rest of the NFL. Those two guys taught everybody, if you have a run and shoot quarterback, you better look at every aspect of his game and how it's going to relate to a pro game because they don't automatically come in and make it. Coming up on Top 10 Draft Bust. They don't have a quarterback! Why Keith Schuler wasn't a man of the people. I went into Coach Turner. I said, Coach, why do these people hate me so much?
all-time draft bus. Keith Schuler. We were the team that was most hurt in the league by the salary cap. So we were going to have to gut our team and start over. And the feeling was that we're going to start over, we're going to start over with a young quarterback. To lead the renaissance, the Redskins hired Cowboys offensive coordinator Norv Turner as their new head coach. Turner and Casserly began the search for the next Troy Aikman and quickly zeroed in on Tennessee's Heath Shuler. With the uh, third pick in the first round, the Washington Redskins select Heath Shuler, quarterback, Tennessee. I don't think you can really comprehend the, the joy that you feel and the, and the true uh, uh, excitement you know, being drafted. After attending many camps, Schuler had to wait until late August to get back on the field because of complications with his contract. A lot of the holdout was not his fault. He was signing a contract that had never been signed in the National Football League before, and it was called an option buyback. That's a standard contract right now in the NFL. So the, the lawyers weren't sure how to write this contract. Far too often people think it was a money holdout when it was actually just language of a contract. He walked into a tough situation because he was taking over for a quarterback that had won a Super Bowl for that team. Way to go, Mark Rippon, the MVP of Super Bowl 26. I think the veterans didn't receive him very well, and the fans really didn't. First one, that's a big one. Is he Schuler a hunk or what? <laughs> Schuler going to pass it over the middle, picked off at the 46 yard line. Going into the end zone, he's going to be picked off. After throwing just eight interceptions in his last year at Tennessee, Schuler threw five in one game against the Cardinals. Schuler is back to put it up and throws it to the left side. It is intercepted. That's when you turn around at the end of the game, you think, is it possible for me to ever complete another ball to an offensive guy ever again? Mentally, emotionally, you just think, wow, I, I need some help here. Instead of help, he got competition from fellow rookie Gus Farratt, a fan favorite. Farratt kind of became the people's quarterback, and Schuler became the outsider. And the fans cheered for Rod every time he stepped on the field, and they booed Schuler. That was the most difficult thing for me to, to, to overcome. They don't have a quarterback! They're losers! And I went into Coach uh, Turner. I said, Coach, why do these people hate me so much? You know, it emotionally affected me, because I've never had people dislike me ever in my life. Issue one, Gus Farratt. How successful will Gus Farratt be? John, if Heath Schuler's performance last week is any measure, which is absolute zero, this guy can't get less than a five. By the 1996 season, the incumbent Schuler had lost his job to the more popular Farratt. We were trying to find a young quarterback. We found a guy in the seventh round ahead of the guy in the first round. That's really what happened. I got to play one down that year, and that was very, very difficult to sit behind and watch. Schuler was traded to New Orleans and immediately named the Saints starter. He's going to be sacked. Roman Piper was there first. Saints from the 39. Short drop. Fire uh, intercepted. Picked up by the Seahawks. Miners coming hard on Schuler. Our number nine draft bus again struggled. And a serious foot injury ended his tenure in the Big Easy. Just the pain was such that there was no way I could continue. And Dick could come up, put his arm around me, and he says, he says, he, that's enough. People say, Heath, well, why in the world did you put yourself through that? I had lost my job because of an injury once, and I made a commitment to myself that if there was any way possible I could stay on the field and play, that's what I would do. With his football career over, Schuler set his sights on a return to Washington, and in 2006, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Most of the guys that were athletes that became politicians used their athletic career as a springboard to political office. Well, Schuler had to convince people the opposite was true. Forget what you saw me do on the field. I could be a lot better as a politician. My little boy will take my Washington Redskin helmet and put it on. He says, Daddy, I want to be just like you. And he doesn't know about those interceptions I threw. You know, that's the great thing about it. Up next on Top 10 Draft Bus, how a straight arrow missed his target. I was suspended for gambling, and my rookie year was really a waste, as was most of my career. From Archie Griffin to Sammy Smith, more running backs have fizzled out than broken out. Until Larry Johnson, Penn State was a factory for draft disappointments. 
Blair Thomas, Curtis Enos, and Kajana Carter came in as promising Nittany Lions, but went out like wounded lambs. But the biggest running back bust of all time was the one who kept getting busted. In 1994 and 95, Nebraska running back Lawrence Phillips led the Cornhuskers to consecutive national titles. He's inside the five. He's in there. Touchdown, Lawrence Phillips. But his college career was tarnished when he was arrested for assaulting his ex-girlfriend. Oh, oh this, right, this right here, this right here really upsets me, man. Arrest me. What? This right here really upsets me, man. This boy right here, man, I don't know what getting them kids, man. I know. They got, they got the world almost at their hands, yeah, man. In their hands. In their hands, yeah. and he blows it by yeah, doing, doing something shit, stupid, man. just like that. Despite serious questions about his character, the St. Louis Rams took a chance on Phillips. St. Louis Rams select Lawrence Phillips, running back, Nebraska. If a guy does a bunch of bad things in college and he's an abusive guy, how is getting a lot of money and fame going to help that? It can't. And some teams say, I still think I can fix a guy. The Tennessee Titans, they thought they could fix Pac-Man Jones. You know, we get him in a structured environment, he'll be okay. In his first year in the NFL, Phillips was arrested three times and fined by the Rams almost 30 times. After spending 23 days in a Nebraska jail for violating his probation, he was picked up outside prison by his new head coach, Dick Vermeil. Go, 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 push, 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 that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. All right, Lawrence. Woo! Well, I'm counting on Lawrence an awful lot. Uh, he's here in camp. He was here for rookie camp. He's doing fine. He's a little bit overweight right now, and it'll take him a while to be 100%. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm counting on him an awful lot. That's it, Lawrence. You're moving better today than on Tuesday already. With Vermeil's support, Phillips' sophomore season would be the best of his career. He breaks through the pen. He's for the five. Touchdown. Phillips driving for the goal line, fighting to the outside. Greg for the touchdown. But the honeymoon didn't last long. When Phillips skipped practice in a dispute over playing time, his biggest champion was forced to release him. I care about the guy. I really do. It's, but I made the decision was best for the Ram organization right now. We were out in the practice field, and he'd cut Lawrence Phillips that day. And he started talking about him, and he started to, uh, to cry. You, you seem kind of sad when you talk about it, almost sort of sad. like a father who's failed. Hey, I want to get into it. You know what? I'm sad. When Dick Vermeil gives up on you and you're a talented football player, you know it's time to find another occupation. Brief stints in Miami and San Francisco were cut short by more arrests. And in 2006, Phillips was convicted on seven counts of assault and now faces up to 20 years in jail. We could talk about character and Lawrence Phillips. When the character makes plays and the team wins games, character's no problem. And that doesn't excuse the behavior. It just goes to show you there are always going to be questions of character on players entering the draft. The number seven all-time draft bust, Arch Lister. Arch Lister was the straightest arrow in the All-American quiver. In fact, there was a, a biography written of him that was called Straight Arrow. In four years at Ohio State, Arch Leister started every game at quarterback. With Heisman Trophy winner Marcus Allen and BYU's Jim McMahon still available, Baltimore bet their future on Schleister. Baltimore Colts select in the Rams spot on the first round. Quarterback Arch Leister of Ohio State. Okay, get that good hand position. Get that thumb in there. Right. After the Colts traded Burt Jones, Schleister competed with fourth-round pick Mike Pagel for the starting job. When we got to camp, we, we hit it off from day one and pushed each other to make each other better. Well, I, I think Art Schleister, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons about Art as far as his ability and everything else, but I have seen him play a number of times. He's a winner, and I'm sure he's going to continue to be a winner. I think the big difference for me was I came from a college team that was a running team and we passed, you know, out of necessity. So I was behind uh, knowledge-wise when I went to the NFL. By the end of training camp, Pago was named the starter, causing a rift between the rookies. 
It started to uh, put some serious damper between the two of us. I was playing most of the time. He wasn't playing much, so he started getting frustrated. It, it just was not uh, a good season for us toward the end of the year. It got to be very nasty. And then you add the, the addiction onto it with me. I just, you know, wasn't the kind of player that I needed to be. Schleister had been hiding a gambling problem since his days at Ohio State. When the NFL went on strike during the 1982 season, he was left alone with his own demons. The gambling for me escalated at that point from being a, a regular, normal gambler to actually being a compulsive gambler. By the time we came back from the strike, I was concentrating more on the gambling than I was on, on actually playing and put a lot of pressure on me. I didn't react very well to the pressure and, and my rookie year was really a waste uh, as was most of my career. That year, Schleister gambled away over $700,000 and it was also discovered that he had bet on NFL games. He was the first player to be disciplined by the league for gambling since Horning and Karras back in the 60s. I was suspended in 83 from by the league for gambling, and, and I understand that. I crossed the line on that. Never bet on any games I played in, but I, you know, I made some mistakes. Everybody thought that this guy was going to be the next greatest. But I think the gambling probably just distracted him so much that he never was able to recover from it. Schleister came back, was caught again, and then was banned. Our number seven draft bust was the first player to receive a lifetime ban since Merle Haps and Frankie Filchok in 1946. I petitioned to the NFL, but they, they wouldn't let me back in at that point. Since his final days in the NFL, Schleister has been incarcerated in 44 different prisons on over 20 felonies. Recently released, he's making one last attempt at straightening his path. I started a foundation, uh, gamblingpreventionawareness.org. What we do is just try to spread the word about the addiction of gambling and about the harms of gambling. Recapping our top 10 draft busts. Number 10, the run and shoot quarterbacks are stopped in their tracks. He was a tough guy because he got sacked a lot. Number nine, Washington whips on a future congressman. Coach, why do these people hate me so much? Number eight, the Rams draft bus gets busted. I don't want to get into it. You know what? I'm sad. And number seven, the Colts gamble and lose on a straight arrow. My rookie year was really a waste, as was most of my career. The number six, all-time draft bus, Andre Bruce. Andre was a, just a freak of nature. He was a guy that was about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, had amazingly long arms. You saw speed, you saw a great level of strength, you saw a guy who instinctively knew how to anticipate the snap. Everybody trying to find the next LT, he was the next guy that people felt could be the next Lawrence Taylor. Going into the 1988 draft, some thought Bruce was the second coming of LT. Others considered him simply the byproduct of a weak draft class. Maybe the worst year for, for a first round, maybe in NFL history. You know, another year in the draft and he's, he's in the middle of the first round, he's not number one. The fact of the matter is, there was nobody there to draft number one. And in fairness to the Falcons, they tried diligently to get rid of that pick. They were forced to get Andre Bruce. In his first season, Bruce flashed his next LT promise and was named to the NFL All-Rookie Team. Despite the selection, doubts still surrounded our number six draft bust. The big question about Andre Bruce was how motivated this guy was, you know, when it came to anything, like learning the defense. I would say every play he didn't make the best effort to leave it all on the field. He wanted to take a little bit home with him. And I think maturity was probably another issue because in addition to drafting Andre Bruce, the Falcons, we, we also drafted Marcus Cotton right behind him, who was a, a talented linebacker from USC. And they were roommates. And, and th they were just like children. That year, Bruce was also busy fathering children and was slapped with two paternity suits. And then there was the incident with a BB gun. Here you get this guy who can't play, okay? And then he's pulling like a BB gun on the pizza guy. I mean, this is just, you could not write a better script than this. Don't you know 
they will lock you up? I know you thought it was fun and cute, but, but you, guys, enough is enough. Disappointed with Bruce's production as a defensive end, new coach Jerry Glenville tried a different approach. He saw him on scout team one day, blocking. I thought he could maybe be a tight end. He had big time tight end ability. Jerry got this wild hair to say, you know what? Let's put him in that tight end. Let him block a little bit. You know, let him go out for a pass or two. I thought it was just a silly, dumb idea to do something like that. Keep him where he is. Keep working at him. See him get him motivated. Because he did go on and play for the next uh, six or seven years as a defensive player in the National Football League. Our number six draft bus had an 11 year career, but never lived up to the hype of being the next Lawrence Taylor. The number five all time draft bus in pouch. Everybody's always trying to, I think, create a legend before it's ever a fact. And I think Tim Couch is this year's hype. Beginning with the 1998 college season, Tim Couch was ordained the first pick of the draft. He may end up being a franchise quarterback, but I think everybody declared him the, the franchise quarterback before we really analyzed whether, he, in fact, he has all the tools to be that guy. In 1999, Kentucky's Tim Couch was at the head of a very deep class of college quarterbacks. Comes the blitz. Couch throwing over the middle. Davis at the 15, the 10, the 5. Still running. Touchdown, Kentucky! Hey, hey. you can't beat a champion. You can't beat a guy that don't want to lose. The resurrected Browns franchise needed a quarterback to build around. If he gets the depth off the ball and takes away that, our Miles will come straight back side to try to hit the, the dig in, uh, in this window here. After ruling out Syracuse's Donovan McNabb, Cleveland struggled to choose between Couch and Oregon's Achilles Smith. Throwers are elite. He's got a good arm, though. Mm -hmm. Good arm. They tried to place as much research and study into this as possible because they knew they had to get this right. One of the knocks on Smith, who also ended up as a bust, was his low football IQ. You know, Keely Smith made a nine on his wonder lick, right? <laughs> a nine. With the uh, first pick in the 1999 draft, the Cleveland Browns selection is from the University of Kentucky quarterback Tim Couch. The expectations on Tim were to take the team to the Super Bowl right off the bat. Well, Tim came out of college without ever looking at a playbook. Now here, all of a sudden, he's got this huge eight-inch thick playbook. Here, Tim, learn this whole thing. By the way, we have no talent, no depth, and no experience around you. He hangs in there, throws, and it's picked off. Plus, there was a guy named Bernie Kozar that was here in 1986 and went 12-4 and four and led his team to the AFC Championship game. People were saying, well, if Bernie can do it, why can't Tim do it? Totally different situation. Bernie had a tremendous amount of talent around him. Tim's team was brand new. The number one draft choice and number one overall pick. Tim Couch is in a quarterback. Couch struggled as a rookie and had his sophomore campaign cut short by injury. Chris Palmer was fired and Butch Davis brought in to jumpstart the fledgling franchise. I tell you the thing that has impressed me more than anything else has been his diligence to learn, to watch and film and coming in and, and being there early and being the leader. And I think that that's really going to pay big dividends for him. Before Steve Spurrier was a bust as an NFL head coach, the former Heisman Trophy winner was a bust as a player. Drafting a quarterback in the first round is risky. Even the legendary Bill Walsh couldn't always predict their success. To have Bill Walsh say that Rick Meyer was the next Joe Montana, I mean, that's hard for anybody to live up to. The number four all-time draft bus, Rick Meyer. As a junior, Rick Meyer emerged as the next great Notre Dame quarterback, with New England holding the first pick in the 1993 draft. Seattle was poised to select either Meyer or Washington State's Drew Bledsoe. Rick Meyer is a guy that I thought was going to be a great NFL quarterback. The Drew Bledsoe-Rick Meyer debate, I thought you'd go with Rick Meyer. The uh, Patriots select Drew Bledsoe, quarterback, Washington State University. 
coveting mire over blood show, the Seahawks got their golden boy. The Seattle Seahawks select Rick Meyer, quarterback at Notre Dame. Here's a kid smart out of Notre Dame, winning program. I don't like to have two things hanging over my head at once. I think if you finish one, then you jump into the next. You can sleep at night and feel better about it. Hopefully I get a chance to play, but uh, I'm not going to put any pressure on myself that it doesn't need to be on there right now. Down the middle, fires, and oh, touchdown! Tom Flores did something that I thought was very smart. He kept things very simple for him. Take a look downfield. If your first choice isn't there, go. Meyer told me he would say, you know, coach, on this play, I'm not quite sure. And they would go, okay, forget that play. We won't run that play. We'll just run stuff you're comfortable with. And he said he went into games with five or six plays. Meyer short drop, flares it out. Touchdown! The more they say Rick Meyer looks like Joe Montana, the more I'm beginning to believe it. In his first year, he was probably one of the more successful rookie quarterbacks in the history of the league. He actually had better rookie stats than Drew Bledsoe did. When we took Drew, Rick Meyer had a better year the first year yeah, right. than Rick, That's but right. nobody remembers that. Right. After that season, it was like, okay, the Seahawks made the right pick. Problem is, he never got better after that. As the offense sort of expanded over his next couple of seasons, he didn't grow with it. What they found out as time went on is that he struggled throwing to his left. Meyer to throw on a point, intercepted by Shaw! What teams were able to do after a while, they stacked everything to his right, and so now he had very few passing lanes to his right and had to throw to his left. When those things happen to a young quarterback, then your tendency is to not read at all. It's to pull the ball down and take off, and they started to take a beating. After throwing a career-high 20 interceptions in 1995, our number four draft bust was benched. Drops back to pass, wings it downfield, and it's picked off by Ray Buchanan. Fortunately for Seattle, the shine on this Golden Domer hadn't worn off for teams like Chicago. They had a young quarterback. They tried to make it work. It didn't, but they got a first-round draft choice back for him because Randy Mueller made one of the great trades of all times and got a first-rounder from Chicago. The day they made the trade, um, I called him and I, and I, I said, Randy, what would you get for him? He said, what, did you, what do you think we got? And I said, you did not get a first round draft pick for Rick Meyer. And he just laughed and I said, Randy, if that's the case, you need to get on a plane right now and go directly to Las Vegas. Meyer started just three games for the Bears before they realized their blunder. Fired down over the middle, it's intercepted. In a 12 year career, Meyer played for seven teams and never lived up to the hype of being the next Joe Montana. Up next on Top 10 Draft Bust. The best offensive lineman ever. The can't miss prospect. No way he can miss. How the incredible bulk turned into a mere mortal. The number three all time draft bust, Brian Bosler. No athlete is an athlete with the intention of being a bust. Bottom took the ball away and went streaking off. The word bust is like the absolute worst word you could give to an athlete. That means you came in and you gave no effort. Coming out of the University of Oklahoma, Brian Bosworth was arguably the most hyped player in college history. They all expect him to be the next uh, great player like a Dick Butkus. Boz was sort of Madonna with shoulder pads, you know, <laughs> only bigger. The phenomenon of Brian Bosworth was totally created by Brian Bosworth and his agent. They came up with this plan that they were going to create this bigger than life football player. There was two people. There was Brian Bosworth, the nice guy, then there was the colorful Boz. If it became time to go play and be aggressive, I could just say, okay, now I've put on the mask and now I'm the boss, like a superhero. In 1987, the two-time Buckus Award winner was kicked off Oklahoma's team for failing a drug test. Despite the controversy, the Seahawks picked our number three draft bust in the supplemental draft. There was not one team that would not have taken Brian Bosworth. They had cornerback speed along with linebacker hitting ability. It was a media frenzy when he first got here. He flew into the practice field in a helicopter when he arrived in the city. You just can't come in with a, as a rookie and land in a helicopter and have a huge mouth and spend 45 minutes on your hair when you haven't made a tackle yet in the NFL. That was the Boz's hairstyle. It wasn't a mullet, it wasn't a flat top, it was the Boz. The whole thing with, with hair is 
The energy starts from the top and it works its way down. So if you feel good about the top, everything down below is going to work better that day too. Our number three draft bus created plenty of buzz, signing a then record 10 year, $11 million contract, suing the NFL for not letting him wear number 44, and smelling like a rose on television. would be uncivilized. I purposely went to Seattle to play the game. I was asked to play my game specifically by the coach. They needed that arrogance that I had. Chuck Knox liked Brian Bosworth because he was a target, and if you're a target, that opens things up for other guys to try to make some big plays. My whole focus each and every week was what do I got to do to get into somebody's head. How can Bosworth play with his jersey like that? Hey, how can Bosworth play with his jersey cut off like that? Look at it. He started out with a game in Denver. He had been mouthing off about what he was going to do to John Elway. He was talking about, you know, John's teeth, you know, it was like Mr. Ed, the horse, and it didn't make uh, he and John any closer, that's for sure. First, I didn't like John because he was a good quarterback, and as a linebacker, that's your arch enemy. Going into that game in Denver, they're selling Boz Buster t-shirts. Saying no Boz and Bozo and the international symbol Boz and the shirts sold like crazy. Well, who created the t-shirts? Turns out it was Boz's company. To this day, everybody remembers Bosworth as a bust. But was he really? And everybody will say, oh, Brian Bosworth, all hype, what a flop. You know, if you watched and studied what Brian Bosworth did, he was talented. He could run. He could tackle. He was a much better player than people ever knew. All they remember is Bo Jackson tromping on him. Bangs through Bosworth. Touchdown Raiders. Jackson took on Bosworth and just blasted and dragged him into the end zone. No matter what he did, Bosworth failed to live up to the expectations he created and was branded a bust. He had built himself into the super cartoon character. As soon as the cartoon balloon got punctured, you know, the whole thing was over. He sort of walked this tightrope of hype and he fell off, he lost. By 1989, injuries had derailed the Boz's once promising career. Thanks to Bo Jackson and all the hype, he'll always be remembered as a bust. My body failed me, and that's that's part of the game. You know, I've had 25 surgeries, I've got more metal in me than the Terminator does, but. If that was the same outcome and I was able to play seven, eight years, then I would probably look at myself much differently than I do now. That's just been a, basically a struggle, filling the voids, being very fortunate in some films. Action! This is the Air Force. It's our bomb. They sent me to get it back. It's not one of those things that this is my passion. My passion was football. I mean, that's what I wanted to do in some way, shape, or form, be part of it. Until I figure that out, I'm going to be kind of that cloud floating around the atmosphere. Our next bus had everyone's head in the clouds. But this Spartan turned out to be a Trojan horse. The number two all-time draft bus, Tony Mandrick. I'm picking up Sports Illustrated, and I'm seeing this guy from Michigan State, and I'm convinced that, yeah, that's everything I think a dominant offensive lineman should be. And he looked bigger and stronger than any offensive lineman I had seen just on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated, I think, helped make Tony Mandarich with that infamous cover, you know, best offensive line prospect ever. The best offensive lineman ever. The greatest offensive line prospect ever. The can't miss prospect. No way he can miss. Tony Mandrich, I mean, was probably the greatest workout I've ever seen. I remember betting Ken Herod. I saw him on film. And I watched him, I said, this guy's got no feet. The guy looked like Hulk Hogan and uh, weighing 300 pounds, running 4'6". Like Hulk Hogan, Tony Mandarich was a colorful character. He loved guns and roses and had a dog named Axel. In the spring of his senior year, he quit school to lift weights on Venice Beach with the reigning Mr. Universe. A guy that had you know, the hype machine behind him, and arguably he was probably in the best draft. When you think about Troy Aikman was in that draft, Barry Sanders, Deion Sanders, Derek Thomas in that draft, that's at the top end. To look back on the guys who were taken around him and what they became, you would say that's one of the worst draft picks ever. 
everybody looks and says, well, you know, of course Troy Aikman was the guy. Well, Troy Aikman didn't even make all Pac-10. So if you were honest about it, we had people on our own staff that wanted to take Tony Mandridge. Most people did see him as a top pick in the draft. My question is, looking back on it, was this guy on steroids? Suspicions of steroid use spread further when Mandarich showed up in Green Bay 15 pounds lighter than his college playing weight. A deflated physique and bad footwork made this former superhero a mere mortal. In all the hype and all the euphoria, forgot to check whether he could play football. I mean, I remember a game that he played against Reggie White when Reggie got his arm hooked under Tony's arm and just threw him aside. The Eagles players were like laughing as they came off the field. And I'm sure Tony Mandrich wasn't used to people laughing at him. So much of his persona was built up in the idea that he was this larger than life figure that everybody was afraid of. To not just get beaten, but humiliated like that, I thought it just took him down to a level where it was hard for him to compete at all. After being out of football for four years, Mandrich decided to give the NFL one more shot and signed with the Colts in 1996. Everybody says, oh, he was the ultimate bust. Well, in Green Bay, yeah, you could probably say that. But at the end of his career, when he came back to Indianapolis, I'm not going to say that he was a great player, but he was an okay player. Do you think that people remember that Tony Mandrich finished his career starting at guard and protecting Peyton Manning? Yeah. The goal's going to throw him right off. We haven't done it yet. Here you are, you know, the old veteran. You got the whole thing. You're going to have a rookie quarterback behind you. Just give me your thoughts on that. You know, I relate it to what happened the year I got drafted because Troy Aikman was the number one pick. And look what he did. And I think Peyton has every chance to do that. I expect him to play like the number one pick in the draft. And the champions of the football world are the Indianapolis Colts. Manning might have been a number one pick, but the quarterback taken right after him is tops on our list. Everybody's always trying to create a legend before it's ever effect. Number four, a golden boy. Rick Meyer looks like Joe Montana. Turns out to be the school. Number three, the boss gets run over in Seattle. Bangs through Bosworth. Number two, the incredible bulk becomes the incredible bus. The guy never could do anything. The number one all-time draft bus, Ryan Lee. It's an age-old question in, in the NFL draft. It was the finished product versus the upside. Ryan Leaf was seen as the guy who might climb farther, and Peyton Manning was seen as the guy who was more NFL-ready at that moment. You know, initially, it wasn't even a deadlock. Leaf was the leader because the rocket laser arm that Peyton Manning talks about in those commercials, Leaf had that. As the process went along, the focus shifted to what was up here. The question was asked in the players' interviews. If you were the first overall pick, what would you do? And Peyton gave some, Peyton kind of an answer, well, you know, we play hard, we work hard. I worked hard during the week, and then I practiced hard, and I studied hard. Ryan Lee says, I got to admit to you, I would go to Vegas, and we'd have a week in Vegas. That should have been the red flag right there that maybe this wasn't the guy that you wanted to draft. San Diego held the second pick in the 1998 draft, one spot behind Indianapolis, who also needed a quarterback. We would rather have taken Peyton. I could talk to Bill Pullen to see if we could trade up to that number one pick, which he wouldn't. The San Diego Chargers select quarterback Brian Leaf. Hey, Ryan, like you plug so and uh, Rick Meyer, are you more of a link uh, with Peyton Manning? Probably, I hope so. Nobody here was disappointed that they were going to get Ryan Leaf instead of Peyton Manning. I think the general consensus was that the Chargers might be getting the guy that had the better future. And I remember the next day as well when Leaf came in from an all-nighter in Vegas, which should have been a red flag at the time. Thanks to my new coaches, my new owners and everything. It's a privilege for me to be up here with them. I feel like I need to reward them in some way. So uh, hopefully a Super Bowl ring or two can uh, do that in the next few years. Leaf was immediately named the Chargers starter and won his first two games. Near side, coming back, touchdown, Brian Stale. He played so well that I, I think he felt like he could do anything and that, you know, maybe this wasn't so tough. I thought, well, that's good. It'll give the guy confidence. And the Kansas City game came and it was a disaster. 
Zeke to throw him. Pass batted down. They're going to ruin a fumble. Lee steps up, throws over the middle. Pass intercepted again. I always remember he was one of 15 for four yards with five turnovers. I even went off the field with Ryan. I said, Ryan, just go in the dressing room. Just tell your teammates, say, hey, you guys, that one's on me. Let's get back to work. I thought that'd be the easiest thing to do. He had a little incident in the locker room where he yelled at a cameraman who happened to be a club employee who was just trying to do his job. I wrote a very small note about it the next day that I just felt that, that Leaf was out of line. Jay came in to inter interview him, and he went off. But don't talk to me, all right? Knock it off! Later that day, after he yelled at me, he read an apology on camera. I misdirected my anger after the Kansas City game. I was extremely disappointed in my performance, and I let it show. He read the piece of paper, and then he crumpled it up and, and threw it back into his locker. So sorry if that sounded kind of rehearsed. I thought somewhere along the line he'd just come in to somebody, the coach, somebody say, you know what, I've screwed up, but it never happened. This was a guy who was woefully immature, and not ready for the spotlight, not ready for responsibility or leadership. She's in love with me. In love with me. Look at me. <laughs> he came in as if he was the, the savior for the organization. It was really disturbing, you know, because you could see it coming and you thought, wow. In 2000, the Chargers lost 15 games. Deep down the right sideline. Pass intercepted by Spark. Ryan lays through a miserable pass. Leaf won just four games in three years as a starter. Fourth interception on Leaf. At a price of $8 million per win, San Diego could no longer afford our number one draft bust. I think it was very much good riddance. This guy was going to turn the franchise around, and instead he helped drive them even further into the depths of the NFL. I mean, they were the worst team in the league that year. But they got the number one pick, and they end up with LaDainian Tomlinson, who has helped resurrect the franchise. Left side, and he will gallop into the end zone. Charger fans are witnesses to history. The Chargers caught lightning in a bottle with LT. But draft history teaches us the benefits of striking it rich are dwarfed by the cost of striking out. finally come for Heinz Ward in Pittsburgh. A look back on his would-be Hall of Fame career. Does he have anything left? And if so, where could he go? RG3 continued to turn heads at the Combine. Steve Mariucci sits down with the Heisman Trophy winner for an exclusive look into what everyone wants to know. Why do you deserve to be the number one pick in the draft? He leaps oh! and goes flying oh! into the end zone. Oh! This list has been four years in the making. We rank our top ten leaps of all time. NFL Total Access. No one else wants to have fun with it? Oh, let's go. to NFL Total Access, Lindsay Rhodes, alongside Andrew Siciliano. I am still Siciliano. She is now Rhodes, <laughs> and I propose a fine jar every time I call you that other name. Yeah. I'm putting in a dollar. I think.